And what we need to do is to add the two lighting components together. So I'm going to use an add. And I'm going to take the color from here. And I'm going to add color from here. And then I'm going to put the result into our output color. Now, in fact, we can do the same with the F connection. So I take the F from here and connect it to an add node and put the output into the output. Now, this is not really an addition because F is not a, a genuine variable, but the purpose of making these connections is to tell the PPR renderer how our lighting model is constructed. And that should give us some specular lighting. Let's see what that looks like when we render. Now, because our surface is flat, we're not going to get very uh, clear specular lighting. So let's go and alter our model. And at the moment, what we've got is a grid with some UVs on it. So let me edit the grid to make it more spherical. And I'll pause the video while I do that. So I've now edited this so that it's, it's more rounded. And we can have a look at a render. And we see we're getting some specular effect here. For example, it's a bit brighter. But probably we need to change the parameters of our specular effect to, to make it clearer. So let's sort out the parameters of our shader. And we do that by having a look at the out output node here. And we've got some parameters here to do with the gap and the width and height of tiles. And we've got a variation ramp. And then we've got a number of parameters here which are to do with lighting. So I'm going to create a new group and call it Lighting. And then if we go up to our material and permit material parameters, we should find that we have a lighting tab. Now sometimes when you promote material parameters, it doesn't quite end up as you expect, and here we seem to have some parameters that are separating our different sections. Let's increase the sharpness of our specular highlight by reducing the roughness and reducing the sharpness and let's have another look at a render so let's have a look at the parameters uh, and rearrange them so they look good on the parameter editor and then we can change them to get a more distinct specular effect. So, as you recall, we do that by selecting the output node and hitting P to bring up the parameter list here. So we've got a group of parameters here which are to do with the planks. So let's select all of them select those and make this new group planks and then we've got a group of parameters here which should do with lighting so let's select all of those and create a new group 
and call that lighting. And let's go up to our wood planks material and promote material parameters and then hit P to bring up a parameter editor and we can see we've got a texture map. Let me change that so that it's our wood texture. We've then got our planks and what I'm going to do here is make the width less. We've got our variation ramp and I'm going to change this so that it's less of variation. Let's give it say a variation like so so that there's a less pronounced variation between the light and the dark planks. And then our lighting, I'm going to turn the diffuse up a bit, I'm going to turn down a bit rather, and turn the specular intensity up a bit. And just so that we can see it, I'm going to make our specular colour a bit red. Let's uh, render that and see what it looks like. We see we're still not getting a very pronounced specular effect. Let me try putting our texture onto a ball so that we can see that it's actually going to work. So let's hide our grid, lay down a sphere, dive inside, do a UV project, select in this case polar projection and we're going to make it a NURBS sphere and then move up one level and make sure that we have the right material applied to it and let's Enlarge it a little bit. And let's render that. And we see we are getting very small specular highlight just here. So we can go to our material and we can change the parameters here. Let's change the U roughness so that it's a bit larger, 0.25, and let's render again. And we're getting a bigger specular highlight. Well, we could continue to refine this shader almost ad infinitum, but I'm just going to add one final element, which is to add some noise to the, the gap between our planks or tiles. And I'm going to do this using the UV noise node. Now, UV noise is a node which adds noise to our S and T values, so we need to input S and T. And then it has a number of parameters here, which I'm going to create for the frequency offset, amplitude, and roughness of our noise. And I'm going to color these. It also has this input P, and it needs this because it calculates the noise based on the position. Now I could just try and feed in the position from a global variables node. Here is one. I'm going to output a single variable, which is the position. I could just connect this directly into the P connector here. But this P here is being measured in camera coordinates. 
which means that if my object moves relative to the camera or the camera moves then this value is going to this value p is going to change even if in some sense the object is static and that's probably not what we want we don't want the noise to change so what we need to do is use rest position uh, rest position is a particular attribute that is sometimes attached to geometry but what this node does is look for that attribute and if it doesn't exist use the incoming position but convert it into the right space for using in this node and the default texture space is in fact the space we need so that gives us new values of s and t and these need to be what go into our nodes here like so now let's have a look and see what that looks like when we render but first I'm going to first I'm going to go up in fact first let's let's take those parameters and make them presentable for our parameter editor so let's select all of these create a new group and call it UV noise the other thing I'm going to do before we test render that is to revert back to our grid object so I'm going to display our grid objects and not our sphere object and I'm also going to disable this edit node so that we are back to having a flat grid and let's render that we're getting a, a complex pattern here it looks quite like cork in fact so it might be quite a nice pattern to keep but the reason for that is that the, the extent of our UV noise let's promote material parameters the extent of our UV noise is clearly far too great so let's take this amplitude right down to I suspect we're going to need it even to be less than that so let's take it down to something really small and let's increase the frequency a bit and let's see what that looks like that's a bit more like it still a little bit too large an amplitude so let's take it down to zero and then take it up to 0 0.5 and the frequency is probably about right in fact let's try that again and that's nice that's giving us a very slight variation in our coordinates so that it produces the slight variation in the planks I also want to jitter these planks and I can do that using a floor node and I'm going to put our multiplied s value into here and the floor node produces an integer that's less than the input value so if the input value here was 1.5 the floor node is going to produce 1 and then I'm going to multiply that by a constant and the constant I'm going to multiply it with is 0.5 and then I'm going to take this value and I'm going to add it to our T coordinate so this needs to go into here and the result needs to go in here and the result needs to go down here and what this should mean if we render
is that uh, planks are now offset. And there's one final problem which you can just see here, which is that although we've got a constant gap width here, the gap in this direction seems to be wider than in this direction. And the reason for that is we're not taking in the, into account the multiplication of the s and t coordinates by a width and height. So we need to correct this by creating a multiply factor using a divide node and I'm going to divide the width by the height and I'm going to use this, let's move it over here I'm going to use this to multiply our gap width and I'm going to use the result here in our S filter step. And let's see whether that's corrected the problem. It hasn't. I've put that onto the wrong mode, so let's swap that round. Let's put that onto the T filter step and have the original gap width onto the S filter step here. And now we can see that our gap is more even all the way around. There's another thing that I want to do to this shader, which is to add some parameter nodes which will allow me to export the different components of our lighting as extra image planes, which can then be reassembled in a compositor. Now, for this purpose, we have to be quite careful about what we export. The first thing we're going to export is the basic color information that's going into our Lambert shading. So I'm going to lay down a parameter node. And I'm going to label this Paint Export. In fact, it doesn't matter what we what we call it because we're going to make it invisible which means it doesn't show up in the parameter editor and here on the export control we're going to export it always and it's going to be a color and I'm going to take the results of this multiply node and put it into our paint export and by convention these are colored now this export parameter here is something that will allow your extra image plane to pick up the variable here and create an image plane which just contains this value for each pixel. And it's quite important what you name it because there's a naming convention. If you have several different objects with several different shaders, they all will need to have a export parameter called paint export if you want to create an image plane of paint exports. So paint is just the incoming color then we need the diffuse illumination but we need to be quite careful about what we are actually exporting here and I'm going to call this diffuse export which is the standard name for this and again we're going to always export it, we're going to make it invisible and we're going to make it a color and let's color it so and in this case we want to put in the illumination but we also want to multiply that by KD because if we recall this illumination value just gives you the lighting it doesn't take into account the diffuse color, which is fine because we're already exporting that. But we do want it to take into account this factor KD. So I'm going to need a multiply node here. And I'm going to need to connect the illumination into here, the product into here, and the KD into here. And that should ensure that we're getting the right 
export here. And then I've in fact already got a node set up here for specular export. Let's start that again. So lay down a parameter. And we're going to call this specular export. We're going to make it invisible. And we're going to always export it. And it's going to be a color. And let's color that again. So again, we need the illumination to go in here. But again, we need to multiply it by the KS factor. So let's multiply and KS. So let's have a look and see whether that works. Let me go up and into our output network, select the Mantra node, and I want to create an extra image plane. So I can do that by clicking the plus button here on the output tab of the properties sub tab. So I've now created an extra image plane and I can either type in the VEX variable here, or I can use the drop-down menu to choose Material Paint Export. And that will automatically set this up for me. And then I'm going to add another image plan. Let's go down to that. And I'm going to use choose Diffuse Export. And then I'm going to add a final image plane and I'm going to choose specular export and then when we render this we should find that we have our paint export which is just the color diffuse export which is just going to be the diffuse lighting so no color just a flat and the specular export which will produce nothing in this case because we're using a flat surface let's go back and select our sphere and re-render and now we see we've got our sphere That's our color, that's our diffuse lighting, and that's our specular lighting. That brings us to the end of this tutorial on writing a basic shader in Houdini. I hope it's been useful.